well, after I came back to Huntsville in 1995, the first thing that I had to accomplish was the settling of my father's estate. And, took it. and your father died what year? He died in 1995. Okay. And soon, although I had been coming to Huntsville before that, in 95, I had to move here almost permanently. From? From New Orleans. Okay. So as I said, the first thing was settling his estate, making appraisals, and it, it was a full-time job. And it takes three years before the IRS will approve the tax return. So that was the first thing I, I, I did. And then the next thing was the, much of the property, downtown property, had some deferred maintenance during my father's latter years. And so... So translated, that means what? Translated, that means making repairs. At the Gate Street house, there was no central air. So I did what you call an investment tax credit. And you, you have to go, which is controlled by the Department of the Interior, and you go through a whole process of stating what's there at the time, what you plan, then that's phase one, then what you plan to do to be approved, and then three, what you have done. And I had a tenant, so I had to do this rather quickly. And um, it was, it, it saves some, some money in investment tax credit, but that wasn't the main reason. I wanted to do it for the, for the discipline of keeping the house as it was. And then this building, the office here, also I had to do, I had to begin doing renovations. And I have continued to do renovations to this building through the years. Uh, it's... What was the state of the build, this building, uh, the, the Schiffman building, when you got here in 95? When I got here, first there was no, well, the biggest thing that happened was I had just finished the house on Gates, and then we had a bad ice storm, and the plaster on the exterior, on the, on the um, I guess that's the, the west side, no, the, the north side of the building, was exposed because the two sister buildings, the two sister bays had been removed during urban renewal. This, this building was one of three exactly alike during the federal period. And the, the plaster fell off. And what I realized was during urban renewal, it hadn't, it hadn't been done properly. They should have put up lath they should have put up an exterior wall, but there was no exterior wall put up, just plaster was put on the wall. And so, yeah, it, water got in there and it froze and the plaster fell off. And meanwhile, the city had allowed the building next door to be tied onto this building without putting an exterior wall between them. Turn that one. Yep. So that has been a, an issue through the years. Uh, so the building right next to it, if they have a leak, it seeps into this building. I talked to Harvey Jones at the time and he recommended some, uh, somebody who worked on plaster. And we, I, it took, I think it was about $20,000 to repair that wall to get, and that was in 95 to put up the lath and to replaster the building. We had scaffolding and so on. And then after that, I renovated. I realized it was time to renovate the building because there was no air and there was no central air. There was a, an old system on the first floor, but the other floors had window units. So the, the investment tax credit was, I used that process again here and put in all new electric 
an all new HVAC and some other minor things. But then through the years, I put on a new foam roof. Uh, I replaced a lot of the windows, all except for the first floor, which didn't need it. And it's been something every year. There have been interior structural issues. The, uh, there was, I realized afterwards there had been a, a big archway in, on the side of the building, like in the front of the building, an interior archway. That had been removed, and so I was beginning to see structural issues that I had to repair. So it's, it's been an ongoing process. Um, that was the first thing I dealt with. And then um, some of the properties downtown, some of the properties I ended up selling, they were just too much for me to, to renovate and take care of by myself. And um, I did, of course, I kept this building. And I also kept Solomon Schiffman's building on the north side of the square where, he had, where we still had the dry goods store. And that's where the Poppy and Parliament are. And I renovated those complete renovation uh, several years ago before the Poppy and Parliament came. So those, that was just a regular renovation. Uh, at the, the other thing that I had to deal with was all the farmland that, had, that was left. And in 95 and the years following, Huntsville had begun to grow and spread over the mountain. And um, Hampton Cove was beginning to develop. And that was all residential. And to backtrack a bit, I had, since the 1970s, given land, farmland, to my children, gifted it. And I continued to gift that, gift it after my father died. I, in, the, in, the, uh, in an effort to move a great deal of the family assets to the next generation. And the IRS has gifting allowance, and so the property wasn't that valuable at the time that I made the gifts, and so I was able to move much of the farm property to my children. And as the area was beginning to develop, and they owned it, I did make one sale so that I had some funds, and so I acted as the bank, and I was able to develop uh, the area where Walmart is and Lowe's. I put in the infrastructure, the roads, the utilities, and so on, which was quite involved, and then I, either sold the tracks and a few I was able to land lease. And then the area where um, Terry Drake and Taylor Road, then I, I developed that in the same way residentially and I was able to sell, sell that. And so through the years, the land has been sold for the children and some has been reinvested in land leases, and so I manage, uh, I'm managing the, the properties for my children and still taking care of the property that I kept for myself. How many acres total was that before, Gosh. approximately? You know, could it have been a, I can't even, I can't remember because the area, just picturing it, uh, where Lowe's is and where Walmart is, you get a visual. And then I know where the, the park is now. Right, and then Sanctuary, uh, Sanctuary Cove is at Taylor and Terry Drake. Those were the big changes. Other areas that were scattered around, I just sold. But those were the two large developments. And there is still uh, land left where, where Walmart is, behind Walmart, that I still have 
that the children have that I'm working on selling that. And the idea of, of disposing of all this property during my lifetime, my, I have a son in Jerusalem, a daughter in Portland, Oregon, and a daughter here. But they've all gone in different directions. And it, was, it has been my hope to take care of it, move it on during my lifetime so they are not, a, not faced with the problem of what to do because they, they don't have the background except for my son. And I did have some background. I wish I had had more, but with help from engineers and others, good lawyers, I've been able to accomplish uh, this development even though I'd never done it before. Do you have records of, of how much your grandfather paid for this land, or great-grandfather who paid for this land? Oh, it was during my grandfather's lifetime and Bob Schiffman's lifetime that we acquired the property, much of the big cove. So some of those records are in the I. Schiffman collection at UAH. So I can't really tell you, but since that area was acquired through uh, foreclosures, much of the Big Cove was. So it wasn't much, and I, I will say that the, the basis, uh, the value, when I've passed it on to my children, they've had to pay huge capital gains when they've sold any property. Right. Because it's so valuable right now. Yeah, because the value has gone up. So they've lost 30% every time I sell something. Yeah. So civically, I've served, since I've been back, I've served on boards. I've been on the symphony board and the board of the Huntsville Historic Foundation. Uh, one important thing that I have done since uh, that civically is I was a member of class 19 of leadership Huntsville. And I learned a lot about Huntsville and about the state. Uh, but the most important thing being in that class was the networking and meeting the other class members. And the lay leader of the class 19 was Chris Russell. And I had met Chris Russell earlier. He, was in, he had been involved with the Child Advocacy Center, and I had reason to, to meet him at that time. And after the class was over, he called me, and he was working for Wells Fargo at that time. He called to solicit my business uh, stocks and bonds and liquid investments. And I had another broker at that time. And in that, during that conversation, I solicited Chris with an idea that I had. And that idea was that Huntsville needed a community foundation. Like many cities, even smaller than Huntsville, around the country. And I had... The, the community foundation, to, I had set up some endowment funds at the Birmingham Jewish Foundation. And I was explaining to Chris how much Huntsville needed something similar so that it's an umbrella organization so people that might not have the ability or the wealth to set up their own personal foundation can go to a community foundation and have different and ha have the opportunity to set up different kinds of funds. This idea came from my experience on the Jewish Endowment Foundation when I was in New Orleans. And so Chris responded and he said, well, let's get together with Sarah Savage, who had been um, the 
the person from the chamber who had uh, been in charge of class 19 along with Chris. So we got together with Sarah and we met and then eventually Lynn Berry, Lynn Vallely now, joined us and we met and we just, we agreed to expand our group and the chamber allowed us to use their offices, the leadership. We used the leadership offices to meet and they provided Sarah's, Sarah and also their staff. And we added different folks. Uh, we added, we realized there had been uh, an earlier community foundation that folded. And the reason we think we thought it folded was because they didn't have a director and they also were not broad based. And so we made sure that, that this board was broad based, age, um, professional abilities, racially, so that it would be more representative of our Huntsville community. And so we added uh, accountants, attorneys, we added Sandra Moon, um, the editor of the, of the newspaper. And we eventually got a 501c3. And today, the Greater Huntsville Community Foundation has millions of dollars. I, can't, I know it's at least over $20 million. They have their office, they have a staff, and they make contributions. Give me an example of a project that this foundation would, just one example. Well, different people have funds, and so they can put monies in, say, you, let's just use a million dollars that they have something, they have sold a business, or, and so they have funds at that point and they want to put it into a philanthropic type fund. Mm -hmm. Then the agency, the, the community foundation holds it, they invest it. You get a tax deduction for making that million dollar contribution. Then you can recommend to the board uh, but grants to say your church or the hospital or some project you might want to want to complete and you can you can make make those contributions that's one type you can set up a trust where different kinds of trust where you might get the income during your lifetime and at the end of your life, it goes to some cause. So does that give you that? But there's so many funds, we could talk all day about the different types of funds. But this is, even though this for me was a service, not necessarily a financial contribution, although I have made contributions to it, but I had already done my endowment giving. So this was more of a service and I, I'll, I, I think I've probably been forgotten in the role that I played in it, but of everything that I've done, I think that's been the most important thing I've done civically. Right. In the Jewish community, shortly after I came back in 1999, I chaired the Temple Centennial event. Okay, you said 99, but you just said before, earlier you came back in 95. I did. I came back in 95, but in 99, I had gotten started in business, gotten started civically, and I wanted to get involved in, in the Jewish community okay. at this point. And so um, the first thing I did was chair the, I was invited to chair the uh, the centennial for the temple. And, and that was quite a lot of fun. And the next thing is I, the Jewish Federation 
of Huntsville in North Alabama. I became involved there. And the Federation raises funds for the Jewish community nationally, internationally, and also has various events, local events. For instance, um, remembering the Holocaust, we have Yom HaShoah, which is the, the remembrance of the Holocaust. We have that event, Israel Independence Day. We make grants uh, for sh students maybe wanting to go to Israel. Uh, we give to Hillel and we have speakers and such. And so I became involved there and I was president and I'm now uh, on, the, on the board, uh, an emeritus member of the board. Uh, the most important thing that I have done at the temple, other than uh, the centennial and, and being a member of the board, was uh, in uh, around 2016, the rabbi asked me if I would make a museum out of the old rabbi's study. This is the 1899 rabbi's study. And I agreed, and that took two years to develop that. And I, and we've named it the Huntsville Jewish Heritage Center because it's not just a room; it's uh, a vestibule, it's display cabinets throughout the the temple, several display cabinets. The, um uh, documenting the history. And this was, the room was just more of a junk room at that time, you know, collecting different things. So I had to find a contractor to help me do it. Before that, actually, I had to, I had to raise funds for doing that. And I was able to raise funds from seven different people, families mostly memorials, some just family donations. So I raised enough funds to do it, to complete the work. And one of the most challenging things that I did was the, the old mantle from the old fireplace in the, in the temple had been put in that room. So I had to put it, I had to make it look like it was original to the room to enable to use that mantle. And one of the, the most difficult things, the summer cover is the, the piece that goes over the fire hole, you know, the metal piece, to find one that fit just perfectly. That took me the longest. I was able to find that, and we were able to find reproduction tiles to put around it. And that it looks like it was meant to be there. Wow. Then we had to, um, there was very little room because there are two stained glass windows in this room and it's only eight by 12. And I found a carpenter through the contractor who built cabinets to fit in the spaces and one of the, ca then what to put in them because we didn't have that many artifacts. So I was able to use some of the temple's artifacts and also I collected a few from various people. And if I wanted to represent something that I didn't have an artifact, I used a photograph. So one cabinet displays the life cycle events and um, the Holocaust in the state of Israel and the Sabbath. The other one is for displays objects from different holidays, all of our festivals and holidays. And the third one is sacred symbols, sacred symbols and images that you might see like a, a yarmulke, a prayer shawl, a menorah, and so on, with explanations, cards explaining everything. So if you go in there, you get a good overview of Judaism. And I have a little pamphlet that, that just a, a short pamphlet that can be given to visitors. 
And then the, the other object in that room is the old rabbi's desk. And above the desk is a video that was made by Blake Hudson. And it, it screams uh, the history of the Huntsville Jewish community from the beginning up until the present. So, um, one thing that, that we did when we had the opening for the Heritage Center, I did a lot of publicity and we had the, a lot of historians to come through. We've had tours since. But Christopher Madcor from the Art Museum came through and he said it is an exquisite jewel box. That was his description. And so I used that, I used that in a lot of the publicity. Um, socially, uh, this was, you know, I had lived in New Orleans all those years from the time I graduated in, in, until I came back to Huntsville. And I missed some of, the, some of the excitement of New Orleans. One evening I was at the art museum and Jack Dempsey had put together a program and of artists, of different, different folks. Uh, this, I can't remember, I think this was a musical evening. And after that, I invited Jack and a young man I had met, Johnny DeMeo, and a fellow I knew, Michael Smith, who was a neighbor of my, my nurse growing up, Cora Barley Benford. And I had enjoyed the evening so much, I said, how about coming back to my apartment above the Schiffman building and we can have some good conversation, and so they did. And the third floor, I had used my grandparents' furniture, and it really looked like a salon. And so we had the most delightful evening talking about everything. They were very bright, creative people. And I said, you know, I've had so much fun. I want you to come back, and I'll give you a call. And when you come back, I want you to bring a friend and we'll read poetry, either our own or somebody else's. And so that happened. And we continued to meet like that every couple of months. And I said, let's add music. And so we added musicians to the mix. And then eventually other artists, painters, potters, we even had a magician to come. And so we would meet, and I asked everybody to bring a snack or something to drink, wine or something non-alcoholic. And we would meet, and we would visit around the dining room table. And then I had some gongs that I would ring. And I said, it's time for the salon. I called it a salon. And we would meet in the in the living room, and I would I got to enjoy everybody else because I don't have any talents, <laughs> and, and I called on each person to do whatever exhibit their talent. And what was really exciting is somebody might if if several people spontaneously did something together, like if somebody was reading a poem and somebody else played some music. And then we had one, one of our guests was a dancer. And if she danced, I mean, that was so exciting if that could happen together. Yeah. I did that, I had these, these events for a number of years until my daughter moved up to the third floor and my grandsons took over the salon room. Wow. <laughs> So, uh, let's see, the other, the, the other thing that I did socially out of the, out of the norm was, and I, we'll talk about that in, when we discuss the ne your next question about legacy. Um, I had given land 
to the city for, for a wildlife sanctuary. And I got a call, this was in 2009, from Clayton Bass, who was the director, the CEO of the art museum, and he wanted to have coffee. And I said, sure. So we met, and what he was interested in doing was donating a painting to be sold and the money to go into the, the wildlife sanctuary that I had established in 2003. And as we talked, we decided that what would be fun, I said, instead of your painting, let's get all the artists you know in town and go take hikes out at the sanctuary. And then they will uh, paint or take photographs or whatnot and be able to sell them and that will that will spread that will be a good promotion for the wildlife sanctuary and so we did and uh, at, at one point we'd meet and do a show and tell of what everybody had painted or produced and then we began to have exhibits and we had exhibits not only in Huntsville at the Art Museum, at Low Mill, we went to Decatur to the Carnegie Library, we went to Florence, we even went to uh, a museum to have an exhibit at Ocean Springs. So this was quite a lot of fun and it lasted a number of years. Now everybody's gotten a bit older and we, oh, it, the exhibits are not easy to put on and we do exhibit every two years at the little green store on the mountain. Mm. So it's still, it's, even though Clayton has moved to Santa Fe. And uh, so I've mentioned my children and where they live all over. And the biggest challenge has been uh, keeping them close to each other. So what I've done with the children was for four years when everybody had finished having babies and they were old enough, I brought them all here for four different summers and I called it Bubby Camp. Now Bubby is the Yiddish word for grandmother and I brought them here and uh, it was just my, my pleasure to do all of this and they stayed on, I rented cabins on the mountain, a, a row of cabins, so they could all be together for two weeks. And the children, my 10 grandchildren, established wonderful relationships with each other. And then every day we, we had activities, just like camp. We went canoeing, we went to water parks, I had gotten some old bikes for the, for the boys, and they rode all over <laughs> and all over town, even down the mountain one day, which they weren't supposed to do. <laughs> and we found them at Walmart. Uh, but they, they, had a, they had a great time. And I think these relationships will last a lifetime. They're, the older ones are now grown, and so it's a little... Bubby Camp phased out, but it was during four important years based on the ages. And as my son John said, Mom, that's the best investment you've ever made. Wow. So that's been fun. March 24th. All right. So what have you done to preserve your family's history? I have donated, given artifacts, archives, land donations, and endowments. And it has really taken me way over 25 years to accomplish this. So first I want to address artifacts. So after my father died in 95 and I came back to Huntsville, I began to recognize over time the, the amount of artifacts I had and the first thing I did was renovate the, the family home at 206 Gates. And that's when I found a number of artifacts outside in the yard. 
And the first one was uh, something that my father had always called a bird bath. And it was a limestone, a limestone trough, trough about 10 feet long and a couple of feet wide. And um, I had to take it up in order to put in a, um, a parking lot for the people that I rented the house to. And I didn't know, I dug it up and I asked Harvey Jones what it was. Harvey was a his, historian and an architect. And he said it was a dairy keeper. And it was usually put in a well house or um, a spring house. And so then the next thing was to see who would take it. This 2,000 pound limestone cut out piece of uh, rock. And I talked to the Weed Museum. They didn't want it. They, had, they were spending money on a new kitchen and Constitution Hall Village had one. So then I went to the Burrett. So the effort to try and find a place, the Burrett agreed to take it. And so they took it. And what they did was really great. They built a spring house around it. And then they attached a water system to um, show how it would have worked in a spring house. And they use it for teaching children dairy, dairy keeping. And see, I've seen it and didn't realize what it was. Oh, you didn't? I've been up there. You, know? you have and you didn't? So it, it has uh, a shallow section and a deeper section. And the shallow section has little round indentations. Well, that was where they put their eggs and their butter. And then the deeper section is where they kept the milk. And the only hen I had was my grandfather said his grandmother, Henrietta Bernstein, kept milk in it. Well, I'd never figured out how that could be with this object buried in the ground. And how old is it approximately? I would say that it was probably put in there before the Bernsteins bought the house. Uh, when the house was built in 1818. So it was put there in the early 1800s. And these dairy keepers were for more well-to-do families. Everybody didn't have something like this. Wow. So I assume since there was no spring there that it was put in, uh, in the well house. So up at Burrett, is there a plaque on there? Yes, it says the Bernstein house. So I donated in memory of the Bernsteins. Right. So the, other, the next thing that I uh, found was, um, these were interesting, I had a stepping stone for mounting horses. Uh, and, and there are a number of them around town, if you look out in front of people's houses, in Twickenham. But, but the ones I've seen in Twickenham, are those still the originals or are they reproductions? No, I would say they were originals. Okay. And so this is, some of them have two layers. You know, you step up, but this one was for Oscar Goldsmith because it has Goldsmith okay. on it. So I had that and um, I had a property marker. So families had property markers. Most of them, have, they've been destroyed, but this one was Bernstein and it was at the corner of Franklin and Gates because he had purchased the whole strip of land, the house that he bought included all the lots on fronting on Gates Street and it had Bernstein on it. And then I had stepping stones that were used in the original house. So I took all of those and I took them to Maple Hill Cemetery because I had uh, some family lot plots, and I took six of those plots and created a garden. And I had a, a, have a nice wrought iron bench there. And it's really quite lovely. It's the only, I called it the garden of meditation and reflection in memory of my father, Lawrence Goldsmith, Jr. So that was, that was the next legacy <clears throat> artifact that I had 
established somewhere in memory of the family. And then the third item in the yard was um, a bell from the Southern Railroad Company. And it was given to my grandfather <clears throat> uh, for the Southern Railroad were giving away old locomotive bells to as gifts to special people or organizations and such. And my grandfather had asked him, asked Hardy C., who was uh, one of the um, officers at Southern Railway, if he could have one of those locomotive bells. And he gave him one, and my grandfather erected it at Holly Tree Camp that I've mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And after the camp closed, my, my grandfather put it in the yard, erect, put it up on a telephone pole. So I had that to get rid of. And I had some tree work, and I asked him to take to cut down the, the bell while they were at it. And I gave it to the railroad, the depot museum. And it's, it's, and it's at the depot, the depot museum. <clears throat> so it's just an example of, you know, you have artifacts and what to do with them and the effort it takes to find the right place. It just takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time, a lot of thought and talk. That's why you don't see a lot of things because most people probably buried their dairy keepers mm -hmm. and right. property. Yeah, yeah, you know, they, they were too big. How are you going to get rid of them? Right. Um, so, for instance, the, the, the bell the, <coughs> at the, at the rail, rail, depot. Railroad. The, the, the dairy keeper when you gave these things to uh, Burrett and the depot, for instance, mm -hmm. um, are they required to keep these things? I mean, is there any st special stipulation? I mean, for instance, 50 years or 100 years from now, could they get rid of it? Or uh, how does that work? I don't well, know if works. you, in, you in know. Words, words, explain, I guess, how to, you do to, it? to the historians very briefly what that entails in terms of if you if you give something first you have to have it appraised uh, because they want to know how to insure it okay and so did you have to pay for that and i had to pay for an appraisal how much so for instance how much well it just you know it depends on the size of it jane mabry was living at the time and she did many of my appraisals and she was very dear and very reasonable. I can't remember what it okay. cost to. Not a whole lot, but in the hundreds, right. because uh, it has to be written up a certain way. So the dairy keeper, what, what was that worth? Maybe a few thousand dollars. Was it? Mm -hmm. And then I can, uh, I, I was able to deduct it on my tax return. Right. And, um, so not only that, often museums require that you transport oh. whatever you're giving. In the case of, the, of, the, of these objects, I had to transport everything to the, the cemetery and, and have a landscape person to, a landscape architect, design it and put it together. Right. And, and it's in, the 1874 Jewish section of Maple Hill, which is right at the, at the end of McClung at, at California Street. Right. It, you know, people have enjoyed it. Right. The cemetery staff goes there always to, to sit and have lunch. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, let's see, so then the railroad, I can't remember, it's been quite a while ago, but you usually, the Burrett did come take that because it took a number of men and a truck, a crane. Uh, a crane. It was a, I, I couldn't organize that. But some other artifacts that I'll get to, I did have to transport. Um, so I w initially, I wasn't aware of the size of the family the collection of artifacts until I got, until I got here. And um, 
and I re uh, there were a number of them at the house and a number of them here at the office in the vault upstairs and in the vault, a similar vault in the basement. But as I was saying, the, the biggest collection was uh, paintings, like for instance, a painting of the, by the uh, artist Fry of my great, great, my great grandmother, Betty Hurstein, her sister and brother as children. And uh, there was a paint, the, Maurice Grosser's painting of me, one of his grandfather, Oscar Goldsmith. These were some of the paintings. I had a lot of pictures. I had silver, including my grandmother's sterling silver punch bowl, a silver dipper that belonged to the Bernsteins, um, clothing, a suit that belonged to Morris Bernstein that he had made in Germany on one of his return trips. My grandmother's wedding dress from 1908. So I had clothing, um, all sorts of small objects like perfume bottles, snuff boxes, seals, where you used you, you used um, to, to uh, close your letters and put your stamp on it, and it was a stamp. They don't use those anymore. That was before we licked envelopes. Or emailed, yeah. Or emails, right. Um, documents, historical documents. My grandfather's and my um, Solomon Schiffman, my great great uncle's Masonic Lodge 32 degree Mason certificates. And tons of pictures, everything from daguerreotype to tin types. I mean, it's just a collection of the history of photography, family pictures. And these are where? So all of these items, and one of the biggest item, I had furniture, was a grandfather clock that I am assuming belonged to Solomon Schiffman, and it was one of the very early grandfather clocks made, it, he, and he must have gotten it in Cincinnati. And it was, um, I had it in the, in the hall here, but it had, uh, I, it had been inherited from Betty Schiffman by her son, Robert Schiffman. It was mentioned in her will and then when he died, it was just left here by his widow, and so our family had it. And I'm assuming that since Solomon was from Cincinnati, that he must have purchased it. Now, it probably was shipped on the train, and when it got here, it, would have been, it wouldn't have been assembled. It would have been in parts. The, mechanic, the mechanical part was separate from... The, the case, and I, it is my assumption that Morris Bernstein, who would have been the clockmaker in town, would have probably assembled it for him. So that grandfather clock passed from Solomon to Isaac Schiffman, then to his wife, and down through the generations. So that was, that, that was huge, because I had to have it packed up. And where is it now? Now, all of these items went to the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia. It is now renamed the Weitzman Museum of American Jewish History. And figuring out where to, where to put all of these, this huge collection, because first, it's important to keep a collection as close to home as you can. But there was no museum in town that could that could house a collection like this. Uh, so the first thing I did was I asked the Burrett if they would have an exhibit, just so I, Huntsville could see the exhibit. And they agreed, and it was a wonderful exhibit. And Stephanie Timberlake, who's a curator, put it all together, wrote all the little, the cards explaining what everything was, and it, after it was up, I asked uh, Blake Hudson, who, was this, who I knew, the city videographer, if he would video 
the, the exhibit. And he did, and I read all, it was a voiceover, and I read all the cards. And it would flash back to me a little bit, but it centered on the whole exhibit. And how long ago was that? Oh gosh, this was, this was I think, around 2009. It was, so then I had, uh, we used this as, uh, at the exhibit as an entrance, as an overview of the collection, so people could listen to it and then go to, that was the purpose of doing this, was to have that brief documentary at the beginning. Wow. So then I had, uh, I had promotional material that I didn't realize. And as I was looking for places to take this, this collection, uh, I, I, I sent it to the Bremen Museum in Atlanta. It's a Jewish museum and Holocaust, and they were very interested in it. And also, uh, a friend of mine brought someone she knew over from out of town, can't remember her name, and I showed her some of the, the items that I had down on this, in my office, in a case, and she said, what are you going to do with all this? I said, I really don't know. I've talked to a couple of museums. And she said, it really belongs to the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. And I said, I, have, I don't have a contact. She said, I do. I know people there. And I said, well, I have a, a DVD of this a part of this collection that um, that I had done when it was exhibited at the Burrett Museum here. And she said, well, give, give me a copy and I'll take it to the National Museum. So she took it to the curator and they were very interested because they, the National Museum had a, a good example of the Jewish community in the Northeast uh, the revolutionary period, uh, the immigration to the, to the West, but they were lacking the Southern Jewish story. And I had it. And so they, they really wanted it. And they sent their head curator down to Huntsville to spend several days to look at it. And they wanted it. So then I had a decision. The Bremen Museum wanted it and the National Museum wanted it. So I had a group of friends over, including Jane Mabry, who was, had done appraisals before. I had Blake over. I had uh, Susanna Lieberman, who was the, uh, li at the library. She was the archivist there. And some friends who were, I respected their opinion. And they met the people from, I had a little afternoon party when the, when the people from the Bremen were here to look at it for several days and when the people from the National Museum were here. And then we met and we talked and they all advised me to give it to the National Museum to fill in that slot that was needed. So that's how they accepted it. But you can get an idea of the work that it took to even find where that's why so many collections are lost. Right. It's because people don't, don't realize what they have, and then it's the effort to get it to the right place. So then the, the question you asked me about getting it there. So I was they found the right moving company that does artifacts, that moves artifacts. And they came here, and to give you an idea of the size of the collection, it, they came in a large truck, and it took several men two or three days to pack everything up and then drive it back to Philadelphia. And that was at my expense. <laughs> and that's the, way museums, that's the way museums work, because once it gets there, it's a huge expense for them to put it together, to store it, 
and to display it. And today there is a, a very large display of the immigrant generation that's, that's still up. So if I went to Philadelphia, I would see some of the stuff. I'm sure they, they, if it's not that, they will keep an exhibit up. If it's not the one that's there, when I went up to see it, uh, they would have other things. And they, things are scattered throughout the museum. But this is one that's devoted just to this collection. Wow. Wow. So. And so, again, it, just an inordinate amount of time and, I mean, Tremendous constant. amount. I'd, when my father died in 95 and I began to collect all this, this memorabilia, these artifacts, and I didn't donate it until 2011. So it took all that time to do that. So you, let's see, some of the other artifacts that I gave, I had five uh, original paintings by Howard Whedon. And these were purchased by Henrietta, Bernstein, Henrietta and Morris Bernstein for two of their daughters who married. One daughter never married, but they, they bought them for uh, Betty Goldsmith when she married and Lily Lichtenstatter, their youngest daughter. And uh, Sophie, as I said, Sophie, their, their eldest, was she the eldest? She was the eldest. And Betty was the middle daughter, but Sophie never married. And so that it ended up that there were six paintings and one went to my grandfather's sister and she, the, the heirs gave it to the Weed Museum. And I ended, it ended up that I had the other five from uh, the Lichtenstetter family and from my grandfather. And I gave those to, to the art museum here, Huntsville. the Huntsville Museum of Art. So I think those, those were the major artifacts. How, that, often, how often do they display those? Not as often as I would really like, but they did display them uh, for, they have displayed them from time to time. Now, they don't want to display them that often because it exposes them oh, right. to light, so they, to protect them. And then they, they have a huge collection of paintings in their vault, and uh, they rotate them. Okay. So they're out when they're out. But um, I didn't want to sell them. They're quite valuable. And my kids didn't, my children didn't want them because they, it was awkward. One, one daughter lives in, Phil, in uh, Portland and my son in Jerusalem. And to have four pictures, paintings of former slaves was awkward for them. Right. But of course here and the surrounding areas and collectors don't think about, they're, they're wonderful pictures, right. paintings. So when I came here first time in 2005, you still had a lot of old vintage office equipment. Where did the office... Did oh, the, right, the office equipment. Did the office equipment go up to Philadelphia or...? Okay, some of the office equipment, they chose whatever they wanted and, I, and they, that was part of what they took. And I had some things that they had left. And also, uh, after 2011, I did a lot of work on the building. And when I did work on the building, especially in the basement, different objects were found. Like there was an old battery for, uh, that was for, um, it was for a fan. And it was advertised, I did a lot of homework on objects that I found here. And all I can think of is that that fan was in the basement because if they were using the vault in the basement, it got pretty hot. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they set that up. There were square nails, just all sorts of things. 
And so that was like a second collection. Nothing like what I gave to, the, to Philadelphia. But I gave this collection. Um, some of it went to UAH. And I had two display cabinets here with some small office memorabilia. And I gave that to the Huntsville Public Library. And it's exhibited, um, I, I'm not sure, it was on the third floor, if it's on the second floor now, okay. in two big cases. So there's an I. Schiffman collection. Okay. So the next thing that uh, are archives. And the first thing I found when I was, after my grandfather died in the vault was his Holocaust collection and his United Jewish Appeal collection. And the Holocaust collection were letters, papers, written to back and forth with my grandmother, Annie's first cousins in Germany. And they begin in the 1930s, around 1937, until 1941, when all the letters stopped. Uh, that was when the final solution began, and no letters were able to get out. Now, of the five families that he attempted to get out of Germany, one, he was able to save one family, the Ludwig Marx family, because they had an early visa. And they got out, I think, by 1939. But all the other families were lost. He wasn't able to bring them out. But these letters fill a, an entire box, um, archival box. So you can imagine the size of this collection. And there were letters from back and forth with John Sparkman. He sought his help. And it, it was these, uh, they had to fill out ap these applications, these long applications. It's just heartbreaking to read the story. And uh, my grandfather kept them in order. So it's like reading a novel, to a true novel, to read from the beginning with pictures of the family, all the way up to when the letters stop, the back and forth. And at that time, uh, I, I didn't know, I, again, I didn't, where am I going to put them? Where do you put something like this? And I was living in New Orleans at the time, and there was a, a big exhibit there of something called the Precious Legacy. And uh, I met the, the curator of the, this traveling exhibit and told him about this collection and showed him copies of a few items that I had. And he said, um, he, he said there's going to be a Holocaust museum built in Washington. Oh, this is a long time ago. So it was a long time. This was the first thing. So he said it's going to be built. And I, he said that's where it should go. And so what we, I said, well, gosh, I don't, what if, you always worry about items like this, like what if when it's built, I don't, I don't have the ability or I'm not here to donate them. And so he said, I, he said, I'll arrange a meeting with the people that are building the director of the museum. And you come up and you, you come up and talk about your boxes. You, know, you talk about everything. He said, I'll let them know what it is. And so he made an appointment. And I had an extra seat in the airplane. And I took, I brought the boxes up. I also brought the United Jewish Appeal boxes box. Because that is secondary information. It's, it's, it's supportive information for the other papers, because it showed, while he was collecting for the UJA, what he knew as he was trying to bring everyone out. It, it gave more of a, a complete perspective. So I met the, the director and, the, and some folks from the museum, and they wanted them. 
and what we agreed to do, they said you have to have them, an appra have them appraised again. And so they had someone to appraise them, and they, they said you can correspond with him, but we'll transport them over to him to appraise. And we agreed that the Precious Legacy um, exhibit, the people in charge of that, would hold these until the, until the museum was built, and then they would take them over. And I made a contribution at the time because I did get a nice tax deduction. And so I made a, a contribution equal to my tax deduction. I just did, felt really like I, I couldn't take a tax deduction for that. Oh, and right, right, right. I'm with for, you. For, for papers of this sort. Right. And uh, so I... And so I made the contribution at the time in the Precious Legacy organization, held it all, and when the museum was built, it was all transported. And I have, you know, it's, it's at the museum, and it took, they got, they had so much material from so many people when they built that museum. It took a long time for them to organize it. But it is it it has been organized, and it's it can be accessed digitally now. Oh wow! Okay. So it's up there. So if I log into the Holocaust Museum, I can... right? And uh, gosh, now I think it's called the Lawrence Goldsmith Collection. I don't know if they have it under my name or his name okay. right now. I can't remember. But my name, my married name was Hanau, so it might be under Margaret Ann Goldsmith Hanau. But to fast forward, I kept copies of everything. And I gave, much later, I gave those copies to UAH. Okay. So they, anyone can go to uni the university and see copies of almost everything. So that was, that, that was my first uh, archival effort. Uh, I also had uh, a, an archive that my grandfather had collected. Uh, he took care of the Jewish section of Maple Hill Cemetery, and that was a box of materials. He collected from the Jewish community, and he built, um, he built up a fund because he used it sell, very seldom he used his own gardener to take care of the Jewish section. And he saved the money and, and, and put it in a trust. And so that trust was accumulated. And that's, um, that, that I'll, I'll discuss that later. But those papers I gave, I felt, I wish I had kept them here because you really should keep all, as much of your collection in the same place. But I felt so badly that I had not given the huge collection of artifacts to the Bremen Museum, and so I gave this collection to the Bremen Museum. But there is information at UAH about it. And then uh, the, the next thing, of course, is the family archives. And that contains 150 boxes, and the first 100 boxes, that collection was mainly the family business, I, Schiffman and Company, and it's preceded with the Solomon Schiffman collection, his business, and there's a small collection there, but I, Schiffman collection is huge. It starts in the 1930s or or prior when it was a partnership and through the incorporation and all the businesses that uh, it operated through the, 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 the family operated through the years. And I gave that to the Huntsville Madison County Public Library and this was during the 1980s. And then after, as time went on, and I found more material and collected more material. I, I wanted to give that to the university because 
the library archive, they were beginning to transition the archives at the library to just a, a room on the second floor. They weren't interested, I didn't think, in keeping this huge art, art archive. And, I, and the university, since I was giving my next 50 boxes to them, they wanted them. So I approached both boards and the, uh, the archival department at UAH and I went to the board of the library and they agreed to deaccession, which is very rare for an archive or anybody to deaccession part of their collection. And they did and it went, since I had already donated it, it didn't come back to me. It had to go directly from the library to UAH. These, this collection, not only the business, the family business, 50 boxes include all of the family members, all of their papers. And I spent 10 years on this collection. And I had Susanna Lieberman, she helped me on the weekends and then she moved away from town and the UAH told me about a young man, Vaughn Bocino, and I hired him to help me because I could only do so, so much and I wanted to prepare this part of the collection so that students could use it immediately because it takes years for archive for archival departments to organize collections. And I, and I, wanted, to, I wanted to save them that effort. So I bought all of the, the boxes, the folders, every, all the archival material, the proper archival material, and had it all arranged. And uh, it's, I have a box on each of the family members that I had mentioned in your first question. All the, some, some boxes are, I have more than others. I had a great deal on Morris Bernstein, not quite as many on Robert Hurstein. But uh, if you can imagine spending 10 years on this project, and I wrote then what I had realized and what I had learned through all this process I'd been through is, for me to write something from my perspective. And from what I had learned and what I had put together, I wrote what I call vignettes. And I wrote about 100 vignettes on each. Now these cover all of the family members, some of their artifacts. For instance, it, it, there might be a vignette on silver flower baskets for, for brides. Uh, walking sticks and walking canes, the difference between those. So I tried to do some of the research that would be interesting and helpful to researchers in the future. So that, the vignettes went with everything to UAH, and it is called the Goldsmith Schiffman Collection. And in, a, in addition, when after I gave those, I had I had made copies of a lot of the paintings that I had given to the National Museum. In Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. And so I gave them uh, a copy, copies of all the Whedons that I gave. And I'll tell you, they look, they look so much like the original, you would never know. Really? <laughs> but they're there. I mean, they're not, they're not, ex they're exhibited as copies. And then a painting of, of me uh, that Maurice Grosser did is there. It's, it's kind of fun. It's in the entrance room. It's in, to the archival department. And Frances Roberts is, is, is above me. <laughs> She's there right next to me. Uh, no, we're talking at... At the at UAH. At UAH. Uh-huh. And this is in the basement. The archival department is in the basement because that's... It's, protected area down there. And I gave uh, books 
collections of books. For instance, the, the box on my father's first cousin, Maurice Grocer, who I mentioned, you know, who did the paintings, I had uh, a box of his books and the books that he had written and books that related to Maurice. So they're in the collection and other books that I have collected through the years that I felt were, would be helpful. So the collection has its own library. And the, the other thing in that collection is our family had, I had videos. Videos that go back to copy, make videos that were copies of 16 millimeter film a film when I was five years old, uh, a film of uh, Christmas parties e each year that show my grandparents and the na friends th who came over for a Christmas party. They had Christmas parties? They had Christmas parties. That's because it wasn't unusual for Jews to celebrate Christmas, not really in a religious sense, but to have in the secular sense. It, it, it's part of the acculturation mm -hmm. of groups that, that immigrate to an, another country and they take on the culture of, of the area. So anyway, I, I have about 20, I had 20 videos. Some of them were, were VHS, some of them had been transferred to DVDs and I gave this whole collection. And Blake, was kind enough to transfer all of these to one hard drive. So <clears throat> the university now has the original and they have the copies. The digital. The digit, yeah, that they can look at, which will, can go with the collection. Yeah. For instance, there's uh, one video that was done for the for the temple when I did the Huntsville Jewish Heritage Center. And it has a lot of pictures of some of the early ancestors in it and researching the, the material in this collection at UAH is just, it is so much, it's so comprehensive. You, you seldom find a collection that covers so much. That family. That covers family. the family and, and gives extra material. I think I have to say that what I had learned along the way from uh, museums, from all the people, they were all my teachers. And I wouldn't have known the importance of all this had I not had the teachers along the way. Right. Uh, so the, in, answer, in answering your question of what I have done for the legacy. I've mentioned artifacts and archives. And the next thing are, were land donations. And we've talked about the Goldsmith Schiffman field already. And what I did there was I realized, I think this was, it was about 2012 or 13, that our, in looking over the deed, there were some restrictions on the deed that it had to be used for the school children. And that, I didn't know if that could be limiting in the future. And I talked to Mayor Tommy Battle, and I said, what I, what I think we need to do is remove all the restrictions in the deed, in the original deed. And he agreed, and at that point in time, I. Well, I know all of the heirs because all the heirs had to quit claim the deed for us to make this change. And so uh, the city did have a law firm do this. It took several, it took over a year to contact everybody. One as far away as Scotland. Who had, a, a, who had claims on it? Any of the heirs of the original donors. And the original donors And the, the original donors were Oscar Goldsmith, because Betty had died and it was her, in her memory. Isaac Schiffman had died and it was in memory of 
Betty Schiffman. So then it, it included um, Isaac Schiffman's children, my grandmother Annie, his daughter, my, and Oscar Goldsmith's son, my grandfather, and my grandmother's brother and his wife. So those were the donors at the time. So now it included any of their children or grandchildren. And all the children were gone, so I knew the grandchildren. And I was able to put, to put the law firm in contact with all the grandchildren. And one of them is in Scotland? And one lived in Scotland. So I wrote them and explained the situation. I said, I think we, the, our, our ancestors would have wanted this to happen. They wouldn't want anything to prevent the field from being used to its, to its highest and best use. And so they agreed. And so quit claim deeds had to be signed by everybody, wherever they were. The deeds were sent to them and they had to sign them and have them notarized and get them back. And so we, we were able to transition to the 21st century, the Goldsmith Schiffman field. Now, I, what is my hope is that, of course, the parking is limited now as the area has developed. And it, it hasn't been used for football for a number of years. It's been used for soccer some. So with this change and with the development of that whole area uh, off where the field is off of Schiffman Street and, uh, and it's off of Pratt Avenue behind this a new huge apartment or condo complex that is going up. Mm -hmm that it will be protected because it could be a, a wonderful small park, a coliseum. It could be used for special, all kinds of special purposes. It's really a little jewel. And uh, I've talked to the mayor and they have allocated funds to take care of it. They'll have to repair the wall and hopefully they'll design an interior that will enable it to be used for many purposes and it'll it'll be a, an attraction an, a very nice attraction for downtown Huntsville um, the the first thing that I, I wanted to do for the city was I, I wanted to give them something in memory of the all the ancestors. And I, as I was developing the farmland, I had learned about um, the importance of bottomland that had, that had been, uh, that had been cropped, where the forest had been taken down early and cropped. And the, the Corps of Engineers has something called the a mitigation bank. So you can convert the, these properties back to, from farmland back to wetlands, planting trees and such. And then that mitigation bank is used by developers and such, uh, the city, to replace, to, wetlands that they might have to destroy in their development. So it's an asset because there has to be an exchange of, of dollars when you destroy a, wet, a, a few acres of wetland and you go to a wetland bank. So in any event, I knew that I had property adjoining the Flint River that had properties that had been converted. Plus, this was a beautiful park. And I gave it to the city. It took, again, it wasn't overnight. I had to have a study made. I had to talk to the city. And they had to agree to take it as a park. And so I named it the Goldsmith Schiffman Wildlife Sanctuary. 
the Hayes Preserve already was in existence, but the Hayes Preserve was, is more of a recreational park. Horses allowed, uh, domestic animals allowed, there's a playground for the children. But this is the same terrain as the Hayes Park. And so I didn't want to do the same thing. I wanted something different that would be attractive to another group of people. Uh, painters, writers, uh, bird watchers. I wanted the wildlife to come first not just the animals, but the plants, and so on. And, and so the restrictions, I had to think carefully about the deed here. To, would it be appropriate for all time? And uh, so it is, it does, it restricts it sufficiently that the wildlife will come first. And the mitigation bank, the land that I'm talking about, the city has been working with uh, the Corps of Engineers, and finally the plan, after almost 10 years, has been, was approved, and they have started the, the, the conversion back to, to, uh, to wetlands. And when that's finished, the funds that are collected by the city will be used to build a visitor center. And that was really the purpose of those, those wetlands, because now I see a park that has a visitor center, and it will be a, attractive, attract people not only from the Huntsville area, but hopefully in the surrounding areas and states. So that, is, that was what I did as far as land gift, and then I also gave land, since the area was developing and it needed a school, I also gave land for the Goldsmith Schiffman Elementary School. So this, this whole development there, the land that I sold, the land that I gave to the city, and for the school, for the park and the school, make it just a, a, a lovely neighborhood, the kind of neighborhood you want to be where all developers develop, that, that these sort of amenities are included. So it's the Goldsmith Schiffman Elementary School. So the, the next thing I wanted to do for the Jewish community, and I had I established an endowment fund, and I used the Birmingham Jewish Foundation as the umbrella organization to set that up. And I donated uh, through I. Schiffman and Company a lot of the I. Schiffman and Company liquid assets to set up a fund in Birmingham. And I set it up as a charitable remainder trust. And with this sort of trust, I received the income for a period. And then after that period is over, the fund goes to the charity. And it will, it will eventually go uh, for the purpose of the emergency needs of the Jewish community in Israel and throughout the world. And some of those needs might be, uh, I have already established that fund partially before the, the, the trust is distributed. But it, so far, it has built, helped build bomb shelters in Israel and going, say, to the food bank in Israel. But if anything happened internationally, it would, it would be to help there. So that fund is for the, you know, I, I knew the, the interest of my grandfather and Isaac Schiffman and Oscar Goldsmith of not just the local needs but the international needs of the Jewish community. So that was that's indeed the largest endowment fund I've done. Uh, also, I wanted to do for the temple, for Temple B'nai Shalom that the family had been interested in. And the first thing we set up was 
uh, before I moved back to New, back to Huntsville, our family set up the the Goldsmith the Goldsmith uh, fund for the temple for Temple B'nai Shalom for cultural and educational needs, and so that fund has been used for speakers for events uh, to buy certain books that we might need, sets of books, like a set of Talmud that they needed. And uh, that it's been quite helpful, a film festival and so on. And the other one was the trust. Remember I mentioned my grandfather had set up a trust for the cemetery, the Jewish section of the cemetery. And I was able to move that trust from the bank here to the Birmingham Jewish Foundation for management in perpetuity. And any distribution that is needed will go to the temple, Temple B'nai Shalom. And how it's been used uh, recently, there's been a lot of fungus that's grown on all of Maple Hill Cemetery's stones. And I had them cleaned, and that was the use of the fund. And then I hope it never happens, but if there's ever any kind of vandalism or whatnot, it, this fund would be there to help take care of that problem. And uh, right across from the Jewish section, this old Jewish section, is the Catholic section. The Catholic community, at the same time, the Jewish community set, asked to have a burial ground set aside by the city in the 1800s, so did the Catholic community. And so my, my friends at the, at the Catholic Church uh, saw what was going on and I, I gave them information about how I cleaned, the, had the stones cleaned. So they had their section cleaned also. So hopefully others will see what's the change and you'll see cleaning of the stones throughout the cemetery by different families. Right. Uh, so the Goldsmith Fund for, for the cultural needs for the cemetery and the last fund I set up was to endow my membership in perpetuity. And it's just the Margaret Ann Goldsmith Endowment Fund. So those are the three endowment funds that I've set up. So that covers what I have done for the, for the family in their memory. However, I couldn't have done any of this if, they, if I hadn't had the building the building stones that they established, what they had done in the past. Their, it was their collections. Right. And as far as the endowment funds, the I. Schiffman and Company was not my doing. It was the building up of that was theirs. Now, does the I. Schiffman Company actually still legally exist? It still legally exists. Really? After all this time. Over, over time, beginning with my father, we, um, we were able to have a partial liquidation at one time and remove the land from the corporation and were able to put it into our name separately. The reason for doing this is because the, the tax the tax consequences for corporations changed. It was, they, well, it was, the, you, the corporation was taxed, and again, the dividends to the individuals were taxed. And so to get it, to remove it from the corporation in a partial liquidation, there, there was a tax first to the corporation, but then we had it in our name and were able to dispose of it individually. And my father and I had a, um, a division so that he could do with his land what he wanted and I could do with mine. And I passed mine all to the next gen to my children. Yeah. But what was left in the company was liquid assets, mainly. Yeah. <clears throat> and some downtown property 
that I bought from the company. So it mainly had liquid assets. And it still exists, and there are some left. So how, how would you uh, talk to the historians of 21, 23? What do you want them to focus on? Historians know to look at historic perspectives. But I really want to focus on that. It is so important to look at the historic perspective of the time that each occurrence happened, that the time that my grandparents, my, all my ancestors lived, and look at the world view at that time. Look at what's going on locally, nationally, and internationally. If you don't do that, and if you if you fail to do that, and you project whatever has happened after that point in history, and you project what's going on at that point 100 years from now, I can't imagine what it would be, then you will make such a mistake in interpreting or understanding each, each individual, the decisions they made at at the time that they did it. Realize that they, most, most people, I think most of my ancestors, made the best decision they could at the time, as I have done. But you can't, you don't have a crystal ball. And times change. And what you decide today, if you could decide it again in a year, it would be entirely different. Same thing each decade, and a hundred years from now, you'll say, why in the world did they make that decision? And you have to know that they made it based on the, the local, the national, and the international scene and rules and regulations of that time in history. Um, a perfect example of not considering the historical context of a period are, are doing your sufficient historical research happened to me personally. And I want to dwell, I want to spend some time on this because it is such a, a wonderful example of not paying attention to what's going on. What happened was the the gift of my ancestors of the Goldsmith Schiffman Field, which I've mentioned before, was given in memory of my two great grandmothers, Betty Schiffman and Betty Goldsmith. And at the time, the city needed uh, a football field for the city school children. There was none at the time, not, not for night playing with lights and so on and they gave the field. And the deed at the time, and I, and I want to read that deed because it's, it is really important. And it reads, and I paraphrase, we hereby give, grant, bargain, sell, and convey to the city a municipal corporation in trust for the use and enjoyment of the white students of the public schools of said city and the said athletic field or playground and all the improvements to be erected thereon shall be kept in good condition and repair. And if not used for the purpose prescribed herein or used for any other purpose, then the grantors or their authorized representatives or heirs shall have the right after giving 60 days written notice to the grantee of the violation of this covenant to annul this conveyance. In the event of the annulment of this conveyance in accordance with the provisions therein, the title of said property shall immediately reinvest in said grantor or their heirs at law, and they shall thereon be entitled to immediate possession of said property. It was 2012 and times had changed. The field wasn't being used for fit football any longer. 
uh, the city, the, the school, Huntsville High Games had been moved to another location with better parking and larger facilities. And the park was being used occasionally for soccer games and such, but it was not being used and it was truly falling into dis disrepair. In 2012, I happened to be doing research uh, on the family and giving the getting the archives ready to give to the city. And I noticed in the deed that it had mentioned that it had to be used for the city schools. The, the particular phrase for white students only totally w was irrelevant. It was not enforceable after the 1954 ruling Brown versus the Board of Education. The ruling was a landmark Supreme Court case in which the justices ruled unanimously that racial segregation of children in public schools was unconstitutional. When notified by the city that the wording of the original deed regarding white students only was no longer enforceable back in the 1950s, I remember my grandfather saying that the original language should be ignored and that he was in favor of integration. In 2012, again, I, w I was concerned about the remaining restriction that it had to be used for the children of Huntsville City Schools. And I knew that there would be problems in the future if I weren't around to identify the heirs. Because at that time, I could identify all the heirs. And I also knew that in the future, if the field couldn't be used for school children anymore, that it would fall into disrepair and it would be a problem for the city. So I went to Mayor Tommy Battle and the city legal department to look for a solution to the problem. And the, so the solution was to have all the heirs sign a quick claim deed and for me to sign a quit claim deed. Now I needed to identify all the heirs, get their addresses. I wrote to them all, told them the problem. And one lived in Scotland. Others lived in St. Louis and other parts of the country. So it wasn't easy. This was not an easy process. And the legal department got in touch with a local firm, Lanier Ford, and it took two years for Lanier Ford to work out the quit claim deeds, deeds with all the heirs. And by 2014, this had been completed. The heirs had signed, I had signed, and officially there was a new deed and it was in every, the, all rights and title were invested in the city. And at the time, you know, I, I was surprised. There, was, there were newspaper articles uh, thanking me as if I had given the, the field. I hadn't given the field, it was my ancestors. But it was like it was, it was given anew. And um, the unfortunate thing that during the efforts of the city and me to to get everything straightened out. The, the original deed was reviewed by the Huntsville Times. And without interviewing me, talking to the city, they wrote an article and it was titled, the use of, regarding the use of the city schools. It said, um, the Huntsville Times had looked at the original deed and published this article, Huntsville City Schools quit playing football at Goldsmith Schiffman Field, learn it was deeded for whites only. Suggesting that the reason they stopped playing was because 
of the deed for white children only. That had been totally ignored. Way back, if, if, what were they thinking about? And so it, it, it was disparaging for me, my ancestors, and I was trying to do something that was to prevent problems in the future, yet they dwelled on that. And what they did was, instead of, like I said, instead of interviewing me or going or talking to the city, and instead of the city really researching it, they went to a member of the school board who they knew would be antagonistic to write a disparaging article. And the school board member quoted in the paper said, my opinion is an individual board member they can have it back. Totally misleading the city. Nothing was mentioned, as I said, about the historical context and the Jim Crow laws that existed at that time. The Jim Crow laws, 1877 to 1954, were state and local laws enacted in the late 19th and 20th centuries by white Southern Democrats who dominated state legislatures to disenfranchise and remove political and economic gains made by black people during Reconstruction. The laws were enforceable until 1954 when the Brown versus the Board of Education ruling was adopted. The Jim Crow laws began in the 1880s in various states that required the segregation of races in such common areas as restaurants and theaters and public facilities across the nation, which included parks and athletic fields. If they had done their research, they would have seen other parks donated at that time or during that time frame that had the same language in it. It was standard for the donation of parks and properties for them to contain such discriminatory language. If the Huntsville Times had researched it and interviewed me, as I said before, they would have noted that the phrase for the enjoyment of the white students of the public school stipulation for use was included in the deed, probably, more than likely, not by the family members who donated the land to the city, but by the attorneys who, create, who created the wording of the deed that followed the laws of local and state governments. And they also failed to mention anything about what the city and I were doing to try and remove all restrictions so the field could have its highest and best use from that from this time forward. Since the deed, since the 1914 deed from the Goldsmith and Schiffman family, heirs to the city, the field uh, has been renovated. It's been used for lacrosse games and other sports. The entire area around the field has now ex ex been experiencing revitalization and development, making the field far more important for, for the opportunity of adaptive reuse of the field, possibly for concerts and other venues. A small city park across from the field would be suitable for parking. And I understand that Mayor Battle has uh, allocated uh, a good amount of money for renovation of the field in the near future when construction around it has been finished. And I'm not sure what will happen. It will depend on what the city wants, uh, what the locals want, but it, it can provide a wonderful venue for possibly concerts, uh, other outdoor uses in a, an area that's, that's more uh, more developed than it is now. There'll be a, a greater population there and it, it can become very important. It will be a little crown jewel for the city and for the downtown. 
with its 1930s rock wall and all the nostalgia that people living today have for that field. And that nostalgia can grow as we adapt, as we reuse that field in creative ways. I have to comment that whenever people make a decision, they, I said it at the beginning, that you think of what's going on at the time and you make the very best decision you can, as I have done. My ancestors made the best decision they could when they gave the land in the, in the 1930s. I made the best decision I could all these years later in 2012 and then signed the deed in 2014 to remove all the restrictions. I have to hope that that is the correct decision and the field will be ready for future adaptive reuse and it'll, as I said, it'll be a crown jewel of Huntsville. The other thing that I hope that uh, historians look at in the future is my grandfather, Lawrence Goldsmith. As I said earlier, he, uh, of all my ancestors, is worth a great deal of notice because of the role he played in helping to bring Redstone Arsenal to Huntsville. If he hadn't done that, if the land had not been there for Redstone Arsenal, it wouldn't have been assembled and available when at the end of the war, we had the scientists come to Huntsville and establish the guided missile center. And Huntsville has grown since then. And 95% of the residents today would not be here if, if that one act hadn't have happened. Um, when they're doing research, or somebody's going to do their doctoral dissertation on the family, mm -hmm. or Jews in Huntsville, etc. Yeah. Uh, your wish, however you want to go, uh, you want them to leave your family alone, in other words, you know, or or can they reach out to whoever your descendants are, or what? What? What was? What? what what's your thought after? Margaret Ann is no longer with us. What you would invite them to talk to your your pre, your family in the future, or do you think, or do you think that your family history you've documented it to the nth degree? You provide this interview. You provided documents. You provided all this historical research, that that's where it caps off. That's closing the book with you. Uh, no. No what? <laughs> no, no. I would hope that they would interview descendants, okay. their memories, because my descendants, it depends on when. You know, if it's the next uh, 50 years, my descendants will at least remember me my grandchildren, they won't remember the generations before me. So I would hope, I, that's why I gave all the papers, including mine, that they look at the family honestly with historical perspective and they write papers or do their research and which includes interviewing a, my descendants, people, other people who, who are living at this point in time. And they write the best papers, the best analysis they can. I wouldn't have given all of this if I hadn't thought that the family's role throughout uh, the last hundred and what, 50, almost 150 years, wasn't important to the growth and the development of Huntsville. I wouldn't have done that because it, it took a lot of work. So yes, I would want them to look, to look at it. My only caveat is 
that they look at it and research the time that each that that people lived and the rules and it, for instance the Bernsteins had two slaves and you could look at it oh they had slaves they had the the ex, the historic experience of being slaves in Egypt when when the the ancient Hebrews were slaves how could they have had slaves? But they, it's important that they look at that historically. At that point in time in the 1850s when they were here, when they, the Bernsteins came here, they both had jobs as immigrants often. Both were. The Morris Bernstein and my great-great-grandmother Henrietta, they both worked and had stores. They had to have somebody take care of their three little girls and to take care of the house. And frankly, I don't think these German-speaking immigrants with, with accents and not, they fit into the society, but not socially. They had to have someone, and the only alternative was to buy slaves at that time. So you, you know, I can't look back and be disparaging of them because they had slaves. But they were, they had to, they had to take care of themselves, their family, and I hope, and I'm pretty sure, they took good care of their slaves. In fact, the woman that they, the, the, the female slave that they purchased, Sally, Many years later, I have looked at the picture that Howard Whedon painted of the Beaten Biscuit Lady. And the Beaten Biscuit Lady um, was the same age as Sally would have been. And on the back of that painting is, is the poem, The Beaten Biscuit Lady. And Howard usually painted one picture and put the poem on it and then made copies. And so you might see duplicate, you know, four or five copies of that same person. And I, I, I believe that it was the, the picture, the painting she did was of Sally because the painting I had had the, had the beaten biscuit poem on the back, and Sally would have raised the Bernstein's three girls, one being my great-grandmother, Betty Goldsmith. And Betty Goldsmith had that picture, and I, I think that the Bernstein's had Howard Whedon paint Sally for Betty as a wedding present. I mean, that's, that's just my... When you, when you think about history, you try and put as many facts together as you can, and, you make, and sometimes you make assumptions, and that's my assumption. I think the family was very devoted to Sally, and that she stayed with them even after slavery. What do you wish you could have done that you didn't? When I was raising my children, uh, my grandfather died in 1972, and I, my youngest was a year old. And I began taking courses. Uh, I took accounting, and then I took real estate courses. And of course, that took me away from the children. I, I, it was when my husband was home, it, I took night courses or on the weekend, and then I started to work. And when I worked, it was while they were at school. But then later, as my father was declining, I began coming to Huntsville more. And uh, especially during my youngest, the, the, her teenage years, and I would come for several weeks at a time. 
and I'm sorry that I couldn't juggle better. The, the working, trying to learn what I knew I needed to learn and be with the, be with the three children. And I think my youngest missed me the most during that period. What was the impetus for taking these real estate classes? After my grandfather died and we were discussing his estate, I realized I didn't understand the language, the, the language of business. I had majored in English. And I spoke to uh, a friend of my husband's who was a stockbroker. And I said, I really don't know what to do. What do you suggest? And he said, go take accounting so you can learn the language of business. So I went to University College at Tulane and took accounting for a year, which was very difficult for me. And so that gave me the vocabulary of business. And, and then next, I realized that I needed to learn more about real estate. And I took the course for becoming a, a real estate agent. And I passed that and I went to work for a real estate company for several years. And I continued taking night courses in real estate. I took uh, real estate law, real estate appraisal, and I liked appraisal. And I went to work for different appraisers in town, members of the Appraisal Institute, that MAI. They are sort of the, the top of the top line of appraisers. And I worked as an independent contractor while the kids were at school. And they had different jobs for me. I, and I went from one to the other. Uh, they all knew me, and um, if one had a project, they would, they would call. And so I, would, I worked for three different appraisers during that period. And I learned so much. Not that I made, I made enough money to pay my car and my little overhead, but the main thing was I felt like I was an intern preparing myself for what I needed to do here. So that took away from being a full-time mom. So you saw the writing on the wall back in 72? Yes. That you, this is 51 years ago yeah. from this taping. Right. You saw the writing on the wall yeah. that you needed to get smart about the family business. Right. That's a half a century ago. Yeah. And so I, I, have, I have done what I could along the way, but it's, it's difficult to juggle for any, any mother or any family taking care of their children. And I don't know how I could have done differently. I did the best I could at the time. Um, I also, I also regret, or I'm sorry, wish that what I missed is I, I always dreamed of traveling around the world, taking a semester at sea with a scholar in residence on the boat. And I know colleges do that, but also adults. And I wanted to do that, but I never felt like I had the time to do that because there was so much to accomplish, to learn, and, to, and then after my father died, there was so much to do here with the business. For the last 25 years, in transitioning, um, in transitioning the farmland to urban, developing that, and passing it on to the next generation. So I didn't take time to, to really do what I've always wanted to do, to, to travel and to learn a bit, see other cultures. I've traveled a lot, 
but to have done it all at the same time, I, th I think would have been so exciting to see the differences at this point in time around the world, China, Russia, everywhere. Because most of your international travel was to Israel to visit your son. I, I visited him a lot. I visited Laurie in Portland, Bobby wherever she was. When Bobby was, my, my middle one, was in, after she graduated from college, she biked around Asia. She, was, she went to Japan for a year with a friend and they taught English. And after that year, they had saved enough money that they could travel and they took, uh, they bought bikes and they biked from Kyoto up to Hokkaido, the northern J Japanese island, and then over to China and then across to India and through Eastern Europe and eventually to Israel. And this was over a course of three years. And during that time, I had the good fortune to visit them. I visited them for uh, six weeks in Japan, and then I went to India, and then I went to Eastern Europe, and then finally to Israel. And those trips were, were really fascinating to be able to go with Bobby and Marlon because we didn't travel luxuriously. We didn't sleep in caves like Bobby and Marlon had done and hardcore, but we stayed in some guest houses and I was with the people more, so I understood the culture. It was so different than traveling luxuriously, like, well, not luxuriously, but on tours. And so I wanted, I, I wanted more of that, and I wanted to do it in a consistent way around the world. So those are two things that, that I regret. And there's another thing that happened to me, and it kind of ties in with our last, the last interview. Uh, my grandfather wrote a letter to me at the, during the Susquehanna Centennial in the 1950s. 1955. 1955. And he wrote a letter, and it was buried in the time capsule. And in 2005, when it was dug up, I had the opportunity to read that letter. They didn't let me keep it because they put it all in some archive somewhere, but I have copies of it. And in that letter, he said, I hope you haven't sold any of the land. And that's exactly what I've done. And it's such an example of his advice was correct at that point in time. It was farmland. And he couldn't have ever dreamed of what would have happened after his death, after 1972, and how Huntsville has grown and it's the property, the farmland has developed over in the Big Cove. And you can't farm anymore. There's too much development. And so farmers, it's an aggravation to try and farm. If I had kept the land as it was and farmed it, it wouldn't have been them paying me to farm the land. I would have paid them as gentlemen farmers. That, 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 that's the way it's done now. So it, he couldn't have imagined that. But when I read that letter, I had a kind of sinking, sinking feeling. And I wished he had been here so I could explain that times had changed. And I had three children who were living in different parts of the world and in the country. And they didn't have the background really to have developed the property. I had spent so many years having taken courses and worked that I knew they wouldn't have been able to do it 
and I felt that even though holding it, I knew that it would go up in value, it would have still been a problem for, the, for my three children. And I also knew it could have caused family dissension. And I didn't want to set up a situation that would cause dissension among my three children. Something that I had not been able, I, I knew I could do whatever I could to prevent that. And that was to sell the farmland and distribute the assets to them. Some, some, I'm not quite finished. I might not finish totally. I mean, Huntsville in 55 was still a very small city. We had 27, 29,000 people. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it was still very, very small, you know. So I mean, I don't think you could have seen I never dreamed even 10 years ago that I would see the changes. Right. I, downtown is bustling now. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have been able to dream that would happen right. five years ago, right. or really 10 years ago. Right. So it's, it's another example of what I said in the last, in the last interview that you can't know what's gonna come, so you do what you think is best at that point in time. I have always felt a great sense of responsibility to take care of the family, as I said, and pass it on. And that has really taken me full time the last, since my father died in 95. I've also felt a, a great responsibility to gift our family artifacts and archives to museums, the university, and to complete our family's philanthropy in ways that will benefit the city, Temple B'nai Shalom, and the national and international Jewish community. So I believe, as did my ancestors, that each generation has a responsibility to give back to the community that has provided for them in ways that benefit the citizens of today and the citizens of tomorrow. So I wanted to leave lasting memorials for the legacies for the legacy of my ancestors and an appreciation of the good fortune that I inherited. So that answers really covers the business, the struggles with the business and my children, what, uh, what my grandfather did with his activities, he was able to balance. I don't think I balanced as well as he did. But you did the best you could. But I did the best I could. At the time. At each point in time. And if you said do it all over again right now, I, probably I, do it the same way. I'd probably do it. I, I would do it the same, the same way. Uh, another, another point I want to make, if my ancestors had not come to America when they did, in the 1850s, or even if they had come later. They would have been in Germany at the time of Hitler and the Nazi re regime. And I wouldn't have been here today, and none of their descendants, descendants would likely have been here today. And I do appreciate that so much that they took the risk to leave the old country and come to America with probably very little and take a chance and make a new life here. And it's that gratitude that I feel toward them that also was 
part of the impetus for me doing everything that I've done. And I wanted to, I've wanted to express my gratitude to them. And in doing that, in doing so, I have, I have listened to my teachers. My teachers weren't exactly teachers that you might, might just meet. They were teachers' lessons that I had learned about. The first lesson was a lesson that I learned reading the biography of Edith Stern. Her father uh, started Sears Roebuck, or he built Sears Roebuck. And in her biography, she said, it is easy to give away. What is difficult is to give away wisely. And that has stayed with me, and I realized that whatever I did with giving to my children, giving the family archives, artifacts, land donations, endowments, it has taken a great deal of thought. And I've tried to do it as wisely as I could. The second lesson that I've learned along life's way is a, a story, came from a story. And the story is of Yoni the Sage. And Yoni was walking in the countryside one day. And while he was walking, he came across an old man planting a tree. And he said to the old man, why are you planting that tree? It won't bear apples during your lifetime. And the old man said to Yoni, as my ancestors planted for me, so I plant for my children. And then Yoni was tired and he took a long nap. And it, he napped for many years like Rip Van Winkle. And when he woke up, he saw the tree. And the tree was a big tree with apples on it. And he saw a young man picking apples from the tree. And then Yoni knew the wisdom of planting for others. And then the third lesson I've learned is the Jewish concept of tikkun olam. And there's no exact translation, but it means to heal the world. And no one can heal the world. But what it means meant to me is to take the blessings that we have today, not just the assets we might have or what we might have inherited, but also our abilities, what we can do with ourselves, and do the best we can to leave the world a better place. And I very much hope that these interviews will be helpful to future historians and whoever might listen to this these, these interviews, that they can be in a better place to research the archives, the artifacts, and tell the story of our family. <laughs>